Hi, hello. Uh, I'm Matt Strickland. I'm Professor of Medieval History at the University of Glasgow. And my uh, specialism of research is in uh, chivalry and the laws of war, uh, with particular focus from the 11th to the 13th century. I'm also very interested in castles and their development. Um, and uh, I've also written on rebellion in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries. And my most recent book is a biography of Henry the Young King, the eldest son of Henry II, who was actually crowned king uh, of England in 1170 and jointly ruled with his father, Henry II, till his death in 1183. Uh, but he was a rebellious son. He rebelled twice against his father. And so uh, it's a young life. He dies uh, uh, as a young man of, of dysentery. But it's uh, an intriguing story of uh, a kingdom with two rulers uh, and father against son competition. Okay. So, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Mortimer Society for the invitation to speak to you this morning. Um, I'm really going to do two things. I'm going to set the scene of uh, stone-built castles in Normandy before the conquest, very briefly, then look at the development of the 11th century castle, and then look at the, the conundrum that is the Great Tower. Now, obviously castles are a key element in the conquest of England itself. Most of the castles that go up in the early years of the conquest, which effectively the, the Anglo-Saxon resistance is, is crushed by 1071, but um, there is a threat right the way through the conqueror's reign. Most of these early castles um, were earth and timber, and we've heard Malcolm discuss uh, techniques. I just wanted to put up this reconstruction of Stafford and uh, a detail there of the, the keep and uh, gate entrance, just as a reminder that timber castles could be formidable. We think possibly of a, a bank and palisade as not being effective defence, but some of these timber structures could really be uh, extremely effective. And a famous map here of Mott and ringwork distribution by about 1100. So the predominant form of castles are earth and timber constructions. So stone is always something quite special. And the chronology of castle um, development is that largely in the 12th century, timber is gradually replaced by stone in some castles. Although uh, timber defences continue right the way through, particularly as outworks, into the 14th century. So, the first thing to say is that a stone castle in the 11th century is something very rare and special. And one of the leading stone castles is our very own Ludlow. Now, the extent of sophistication of stone castle building um, in the early stages of the Norman Conquest is nowhere better shown than in the White Tower of London, the Arx Palatina, literally sort of fortress palace, in the words of William the Conqueror's biographer, William of Poitiers, begun in the corner of the old Roman walls of the city. So they make use of pre-existing stone defences. A ditch and a bank goes up, and then gradually the White Tower rises. Um, and it's probable that it wasn't finished uh, at the Conqueror's death in 1087. Similarly, equally sophisticated, uh, rather more enigmatic, is Colchester. Malcolm's mentioned the fact that Colchester Keep sat on the foundations of the Roman temple of Claudius, and again, it made use of the outer defences of the Roman town. And the ground plan of Colchester and the Tower of London are very, very similar. It's clear that they are coming from the same architectural source. And that was the, the castle of Ivry, now Ivry la Bataille, which is on the southeast, there it is, Ivry, on the Norman frontier. Um, <clears throat> built around about uh, 1000 for a ducal kinsman, so that one of the Duke of Normandy's uh, kinsman, Rodolf, Count of Ivry. And notice, we'll come back to this point subsequently in the talk, the link between high status stone building and comital rank, that is the rank of Count, Comes, or Earl. 
And this has uh, uh, legendary proportions by the time that the famous chronicler Audric Vitalis is writing about its construction. Audric's writing in the first decades of the 12th century. Famous, huge, and highly fortified. So this is a plan here. This is um, from Edward Impey's work on the White Tower. Here is Ivry. Here is the White Tower. And uh, Impey has also discovered the foundations of a similar shaped tower at Avranches, down here uh, on the border with Brittany. So you can see that from 11, about 1,000, we're getting the development of really very sophisticated towers marked in these, these cases with this apse, apsical form. And just to go back, in the case of the Tower of London, this forms a chapel, the Chapel of St. John. Now, I think it must be emphasised that these early uh, palace fortresses were, were um, not only sophisticated, they were also um, very limited. It's the, only the Duke, or in the case of post 1066 England, only the king had the wealth and resources to build on such a magnificent scale. But my tapestry shows us um, this fortress, here's William, which is thought to be one of the earliest Norman stone towers um, at Rouen, um, built possibly as early uh, as the, uh, the 980s, 990s by Duke Richard I. And it was deliberately destroyed in 1204, or just after the conquest of Normandy, by Philip Augustus in 1204, because it symbolized ducal power in Normandy, independent ducal power. So these structures are both um, residential, they're fortifications, but they're also highly symbolic. If we then turn to what other early stone-built castles there were in the first decades of the conquest, one of the most famous is Chepstow. And this is all later work, but here is the great tower or the keep rising up from the River Wye on this rocky ridge. And it consists of an early hall with these uh, decorative arches running around this, uh, sorry, this end here. And here's a reconstruction, timber outworks initially. And you can see we're dealing with something very different in scale and sophistication, much less sophisticated and large than the White Tower. Its construction is <clears throat> usually attributed to William Fitzosborne, um, one of the most important lords of the conquest, the conqueror's right-hand man, a, a great marcher lord in, um, in the southwest, but also um, great swathes of palatinate authority in southern England. But William dies, he's killed in, in a battle in Flanders in 1071, so it's possible that if he was the founder of Chepstow, the castle itself had only reached uh, uh, some stage of development by 1071. It may have been continued by his son Roger, Roger de Retoy, who inherits the Earl, Earldom of Hereford, but Roger rebels against the king, King William in 1075. He's forfeited and imprisoned. So we're looking at a window between, let's say, 1067, when the, the first Norman incursions into to Gwent take place, and 1075 for the building, it's possible, but Rick Turner <coughs> has recently suggested that in fact it's not Fitzosborne or Roger, it was actually William, William the Conqueror himself who may have built Chepstow as what uh, Turner calls a hall of audience. So a, a grand statement of Norman power pressing into Wales where the Welsh princes would come um, and submit uh, and recognise the authority of King William and it may be linked to William's very successful um, campaign. It's more like a progress, there's no fighting as far as St. David's in 1081. And <clears throat> uh, scholars who've studied this have pointed to the reuse of Roman stones in the building and also this brick, decorative brick string course. And it's been suggested that this is deliberately invoking Roman authority, a kind of translatio imperii. Closely uh, analogous in some ways, but uh, also uh, distinct, uh, is another very early hall. We, perhaps we couldn't call it a hall keep, it's a fortified stone hall. This time at Richmond in North Yorkshire, 
built from 1071, so again, it's a very early uh, Norman stone castle by Alan, Count of Brittany. Again, a count. Um, so Fitzosborne is, is an earl, Alan is a count. High above the River Swale, there's a curtain wall, we'll come back to that in a minute, and sitting in the angle of the curtain wall is this uh, splendid uh, early Norman hall known as Scollan's Hall. Scollan was the name of Earl Alan's steward. And essentially, it's a two-story building, a lower floor, um, which was a, a, perhaps a, a lower hall or a, a, a basement, and then a first floor hall leading off into a solar uh, and private um, residential uh, accommodation for Earl Allen. And then next to it, here, uh, is a, it's a tower, stone flanking tower, which was uh, a privy. Now, as Malcolm uh, has shown us, um, Langer, built probably by Faulkner, and this uh, earliest known castle, uh, Duel de Fontaine, remind us that the, the, uh, the genesis of these early castles is a fortified stone hall. Um, in this case, uh, a, first, a ground floor entrance is blocked up. It's turned into a, what's that, sort of a pillbox um, by Odo of blois chartres In this case, a first floor entrance uh, into uh, the donjon, the, the keep or great tower. And you can see how Chepstow and Richmond are variations on that theme. And what's striking is Ludlow doesn't have uh, something equivalent to that as far as we can see built in stone, but I'll come on to that in a minute. So, just to recap, early stone castles then are rare. They must have been very expensive. Although we don't know much about the early Norman masons and architects, these must have been skillful men in high demand by <coughs> the greatest in the land. And that raises the question, who built Ludlow? <coughs> if Ludlow is, as we'll see in, in a minute, excuse me, <coughs> a very early Norman castle, um, who was it who built Ludlow? Unfortunately, we're in the dark. We don't have any specific chronicle evidence, nor do we have uh, any fiscal records. Sorry. A very likely contender for the original founder and builder of the castle is Walter de Lacy. Um, although he's not of comital rank, he was one of the most important lords in the Marches of Wales. He fights alongside William Fitzosborne in the conquest uh, of Gwent and Bracaillog. Um, and crucially, in 1075, he supports the king against the rebellion of uh, William Fitzosborne's son, Roger. So he then becomes tenant-in-chief of uh, many of his properties. So by 1086, in Doomsday Book, Walter dies in 1085, um, his manors in seven counties are valued uh, at uh, over £400. So he's not the very highest-ranking Norman noble, but he's pretty, uh, pretty important. And it makes sense for him to have built uh, the first castle at Ludlow. And what's striking is, if that's true, uh, to compare with the other centres of the early Lacey Lordship, Wigmore Morton Bailey, and then Longtown, or US Lacey, as it was uh, called, neither of which seem to have had early stone fortifications. So Ludlow is chosen as something special within the, the portfolio, if you like, of the Lacey lands and uh, castle sites. It's possible that if it wasn't um, Walter de Lacey, it could have been his son, uh, Roger. Um, Roger rebels against William Rufus in 1088. He's pardoned, but then makes uh, the serious error of rebelling again in 1095, um, and he's forfeit and driven into exile. The Lacey manors and castles then go to his brother Hugh, who dies without heirs, and Hugh was loyal to Rufus and Henry. So it could conceivably be any one of these three Laceys, the father, Walter, or the sons, Roger or Hugh. And again, I think uh, the more I prepared this talk, the more I, I found questions but no answers. We, we simply don't know which of these it was, nor do we know quite how long the construction of what we see of visible 11th century Norman work um, how long that actually took, and 
I'd be interested to hear Malcolm's views on the actual construction of the walls. So that's my first section, really just the background due to how, um, how rare these stone castles are and their link to high status. And it may well be that, that Walter was trying to um, show to everybody he'd arrived by building a stone fortress at Ludlow. So now let's turn to look at the, uh, the actual design of the earliest castle. Well, as you can see very clearly when you uh, look at the castle, particularly from Whitcliffe over the river, the castle was built on a promontory, on uh, steep cliffs on the riverside of the site, and the promontory that it forms um, is cut off by a rock-cut ditch which runs all the way around to the sides of the hill. Um, the ditch, as we see it when we go on our, our tour, it's, it was infilled slightly, so there it would have been wider and certainly quite a bit deeper. The fact that the castle was built on rock had a number of advantages. Um, firstly, it meant that the, the rock cut from the ditch could be used in the construction. But secondly, it meant that mining, undermining the walls, by enemy sappers was much harder. And there's a reference, one of the few references to siege techniques um, in this period comes in the accounts of William the Conqueror's siege of the Anglo-Saxon um, town of Exeter in 1068, where his miners undermined one of the Roman walls and they, um, the citizens wisely decide to surrender at that point. Now, ditches, although this is a dry ditch, Ditches are a very important form of defence because what they did was, was two things. They meant that the, the height of the wall from the base of the ditch was, was increased. So you need higher ladders to try and uh, climb over the walls. But possibly even more important, it meant that early forms of siege engines like rams, what they call cats, which is a, um, a covered shelter so miners could reach the base of the walls without being... Um, attack from rocks or arrows, um, you'd have to fill this in to get those machines or belfries, siege towers, to the walls. Uh, and that was no mean feat. So the wider the ditch, the harder it is to bring a siege engine against the walls. I'm sorry. So we've got a promontory site, a rock-cut ditch, which must have been a, a huge feat of, of, of labour, uh, and again, where did that labour come from? Was it, was it local Anglo-Saxons doing their bridge and borough defence work? Possibly. But again, you'd need somebody who was skilled to oversee that process, and possibly even skilled stone cutters. Now, it's uncertain whether this area was originally an earth and timber bank, and that the stone then subsequently replaced. It's not impossible, but uh, as far as I know, there's no direct evidence. And it seems... Uh, that it was built from stone um, ab initio. <clears throat> so a thick curtain wall, 1.7 metres thick, made of shale rubble, and the towers and other details are made of sandstone, ashlar coins and dressings of the windows. And what I'll give you here is a plan of how the castle, uh, or at least not how the castle looks so much, as what Norman worked from the 11th century uh, is extant today and taken away everything else. So if we just um, have a quick comparison of the plan to the photograph here. Remember, this keep is an addition of the, um, <clears throat> the 12th century. So we have a gatehouse, <clears throat> which we'll come to in a second. We have a stretch of curtain wall flanking the ditch, and then a series of towers, all, of course, the, the names of the towers are later, the oven tower, the Poston Tower, which has a little doorway just here. It's hard to see on this photograph, um, but it has a doorway here for um, sallying out or taking messages or basically getting out uh, without too much uh, notice. The Northwest Tower, this part, and you'll see on your plans, I've, I've uh, shamelessly um, plundered Derek Wren's excellent article uh, on Ludlow Castle and given you um, some of these plans, because they're very, very helpful to try and understand this castle. This tower here is known as the Northwest Tower, but it had an addition known as the Closet Tower, sort of put on in, uh, in the 13th century. 
So the Norman work probably didn't uh, reach further than about here. This latrine block, which is such a, a, an impressive feature when you see the castle um, from, um, from down by the, by the river, didn't exist. This is a Mortimer edition of the early 14th century. And then finally we have the so-called Pendover Tower. Now what strikes me is that the towers are strangely placed uh, and that one might expect there to be one here to, um, to add to the defences. Because the point of towers, as we'll see in a second, is that they provided the opportunity for archers to flank the walls with arrows. If, you, if you've ever stood on a tall wall and looked down, you can't actually see the base of the wall without leaning out. Uh, there is a dead ground, in other words, at the bottom. And so if we're thinking purely military terms, these um, towers have an important flanking function. This one would, would defend the gatehouse, for example. So the question which I have no answer to is well, why didn't they add one to this, what seems to me, uh, a fairly vulnerable element of the wall? Now, mural towers on early Norman castles are very rare. Uh, and Ludlow is probably one of the most precocious examples. Usually, their development of the the 12th century and um, perhaps the second half of the 12th century in particular. Henry II, just, just to give you one example, he is a, a, a great castle builder. This is Orford down uh, in Suffolk and uh, a 17th century uh, painting of the now lost curtain walls. If you go to Orford, all you'll see is this fantastic keep built by Henry. But originally there were uh, flanking towers around the enceinte of, uh, of the keep. Similarly, Dover, which is later, this is uh, 1160s, this is Dover, of course, which we saw earlier, and Dover's curtain wall with these flanking towers um, is one of the earliest examples um, of a twin-towered gatehouse. So the, the main entrance is here with an early form of a barbican. Um, Certainly, it's one of the earliest forms in, in Britain. So, the point then is that Ludlow is precocious. And what's striking is even key ducal sites in pre-conquest Normandy don't have these mural towers. Here's Caen. Um, this was established by William the Conqueror uh, in about 10, um, 1060 as a major residence in Lower Normandy. He built a palace there and he fortified the site, but with a simple stone curtain wall and a simple gatehouse. So even at a, a, a palatial site like Caen, the second, uh, second city in Normandy after Rouen, uh, there are no flanking towers at an 11th century stage. And the same is true of Falaise on the southern border of Normandy, a keep built by Henry II, a tower built by uh, Philip Augustus, 13th century, uh, mural towers, but originally it's a rocky promontory with a simple curtain wall. The nearest comparator to uh, Ludlow's mural towers is Richmond, which we saw earlier, built by uh, Earl Allen, Count Allen of Brittany, from around 1071. And just to show you the plan here, we have three towers, one of which has fallen, but this tower, um, the so-called Robin Hood Tower, obviously later named that's this one. Um, Malcolm showed us that on the, uh, the first floor it has a little chapel, but you can see that uh, right from the start, curtain walls with these flanking towers uh, play a key role in the design. But the puzzle is that they're unevenly spaced. Why just on one side? Possibly, it's just a suggestion, this is to do with the way in which the interior design of the domestic buildings was planned. And we might see the same at Ludlow. So the question uh, that I find interesting is where does the idea of these mural towers at Richmond and indeed at Ludlow come from? And if you have answers, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> okay. Now, as I mentioned, the, the idea in purely military terms is that these uh, towers give some kind of flanking protection to the main curtain wall. But one of the early features, one of the reasons that Ludlow is, is an early form of mural tower, is that there are no purpose-built arrow loops or embrasures. The lights that you'll see when we go around are all 
lighting either chambers, mural passages, or in this case, this is the oven tower. Um, this slit here is what we're looking at here, uh, a latrine, so domestic facility. And what that meant was the principal defense of the castle was from the wall head. Now, this is a, a, a lovely, this is, this is from Canterbury Cathedral, stained glass from around uh, the late 1170s, showing the siege of Canterbury by the Danes, but of course it's contemporary equipment um, of Anglo-Norman uh, warriors from uh, the late 1170s. In some castles, we know that hoardings, hoardings, bratis work was built out from putlock holes to create a fighting gallery around the walls from which archers could shoot and stones and other missiles could be dropped down on the walls. As far as I can tell, there is no evidence in the stonework at Ludlow for these wooden hoardings, but remember that the, the towers have been heightened, or almost all of them have been heightened, and they have been uh, changed. So it may be that the evidence for that has just been lost in rebuilding. Certainly, though, crenellations play a key part in defence, and at Ludlow, probably, like on this illustration, they would have had wooden shutters um, that archers could move for uh, cover. Um, famously, Ludlow is besieged in 1139 by King Stephen, um, and he takes with him, um, on a kind of adventure holiday, uh, Earl Henry, the son of David I of Scotland, and during the siege, Earl Henry is caught by a hook, um, lowered by the, uh, the defenders and dragged away, and Stephen manfully rescues Earl Henry. Um, but it shows that wallhead defense could actually be quite aggressive and offensive. Now, the other main feature of uh, the, the towers is that they're open-backed. They might have been backed with the wood, and here is a, a reconstruction of an open back tower at Framlingham from the next century, Framlingham in Norfolk. Or they could have been part of the domestic uh, ranges from the outset. So here's the Northwest Tower, uh, and when we go, you'll see there are two, two sets of stairs going up. It's now blocked, so you can't actually get there, but two sets of stairs on either side leading to a spiral stair, a mural passage, and a latrine. And what's striking is that this mural passage, clearly an integral element of the design, is not defensive. These are not arrow loops, they're simply lights. And if we go to Framlingham, we get some idea of what Ludlow's interior may have looked like before the rebuilding of the great domestic ranges in the 13th and 14th century. So a bailey crammed with buildings, many of which back up against the curtain wall, site of the chapel, chamber block, and in the thickness of the walls, in the case of Framlingham, there are even chimneys. So I wonder then if we looked at the, the plan of Ludlow in the later Middle Ages, here are our Norman towers, the Northwest Tower, the Pendover Tower, They've been integrated into the later residential buildings. It may well be that in the 11th century, some kind of wooden hall or solar or other domestic buildings were built up against these walls. And this wall here, the north wall, uh, only exists to ground floor height in the original Norman work. It's later replaced. So it's hard to know whether there would have been windows for some kind of early Norman uh, hall but it seems to be quite likely. Okay, now let's turn to uh, the last big feature, which is the gatehouse. And this is a re really intriguing, um, but also <coughs> complex piece of uh, architecture. Initially, this was the entrance into the castle. This is a late, in, uh, late 12th century um, uh, archway, after the keep has been blocked up in the late 12th century. So imagine this is an open archway. Imagine, lose the top part here, have a single story vaulted archway into the castle, decorated with shafts and capitals, and the art historians uh, will tell you that 
the, the, the kind of capitals we see here are probably around 1080s, possibly even earlier. And that's one of the key dating, um, pieces of dating evidence for the early nature of the stone castle. So a, a probably barrel vaulted um, main entrance, quite grand and quite deep. What's striking about early Norman castles, other early Norman castles, is how simple the gateways actually are. Here's Richmond, a simple arch, quite a grand arch with decorated capitals, blocked up later. Imagine that's not there going out into the fields, that's the, from looking at it from the inner bailey. Unusually sophisticated is Exeter, Rougemont Castle at Exeter, this is the main gate, um, with very interestingly Anglo-Saxon influenced windows up here. Um, it was blocked later, but originally this was the main entrance to the castle, but it has a, a kind of flying bridge over here, which allowed defence of the gate from above, probably some form of movable bridge as at Ludlow, um, and these buttresses here effectively create an early barbican, but this is unusually sophisticated. Um, what did Ludlow's one look like? Possibly it looked like this, a wonderful castle, um, now in the hands of the Duchy of Lancaster. Uh, this is Tickill in Yorkshire, built by uh, another uh, very important Norman lord, Roger de Brulli. And you can see, here's the Mott Bailey, a massive stone gatehouse. This is looking inside the gatehouse, looking out. There it is from the outside with um, some uh, very fine decorative stonework here. Here's looking at it from, um, from inside the bailey. See how deep it is. So if we imagine a single story, perhaps with a fighting platform on top, Ludlow may have looked similar to this. Now, in the 12th century, there were major changes in design. And these focused largely on the gatehouse, but, sorry, um, the gatehouse was blocked up, a new entry was put very close to the tower uh, with a new archway and a bridge, so bear that in mind when we go on the tour. The outer bailey, which had probably been in timber uh, and earth, was rebuilt in stone with a late uh, 12th century gatehouse, and two square towers, one of which is now gone. So here we are, this archway here has, uh, it's been dated to the late, the very late uh, 12th century because of its sort of transitional form. So major changes which focus on the tower. Now unfortunately, in the 15th century, for reasons that are not clear, possibly damage, the tower was shortened and uh, so when you look at the, the rear of the tower from within the bailey, all of this is late medieval work. And you have to now go down the steps into what was the original entrance passage. And that makes it actually quite difficult to reconstruct. Oops. Now, as Derek Wren argued, what you have, oops, sorry, what you have before this arch is blocked up, so it's still a gate tower, is the raising of the keep, but also bringing it out from being flushed with the walls to add this great front. And it's the south side that is largely intact. So the back of it's gone. We know, or we can deduce, that when you climb up the stairs, here we are, now blocked unfortunately, this was the original entrance up into the keep, you come into a vaulted lobby, which opens out onto the wall walk. There we are, out of the wall walk. Then on this side, there's another lobby here going out onto the wall walk. And this central chamber here seems to have been a two-storied hall. To the side of the great hall is a nicely appointed chamber with cupboards. It has its own private latrine, and the suggestion is that this was the, the personal chamber of the, the Lord of the Castle. And as we go around looking, uh, point out, this is the latrine, this is the chamber. So possibly what we're looking at is something like this, a, a, a vaulted passage, gatehouse, 
being raised to a two-floor hall with a roof hidden behind the third floor of masonry. That was quite common in Norman keeps. And if you're eagle-eyed, you'll see the scar of the roof, uh, even though the rest of the masonry has been built up in the 15th century. What happened above that is harder to determine. Wren has posited uh, a spiral stair going up to this window here. This is this loop. Uh, perhaps another chamber and another one, which you can just actually make out a loop there, slit. But really, this is guesswork. Some sense of what it might have looked like is furnished by Richmond. Now, fascinatingly, at Richmond, very like Ludlow, the original simple entrance was blocked up and a great tower built by uh, another earl, uh, Conan the Little, not only an earl, but a uh, duke of uh, Brittany until Henry II effectively deposed him. Um, but he builds this great tower. And if we could imagine Ludlow rather similar, this actually has two floors in its great hall and a room beneath, but it's a bigger building. Here's the great upper hall at Richmond, so possibly this is what we were looking at at Ludlow. So why do this? Why go to all of the expense and trouble? Well, it, clearly it created some form of high status accommodation for the owner. It creates an imposing symbol of power as it dominates not only the castle, but the town and the landscape. And studies of 12th century great towers have stressed the link between the building of these great uh, keeps with elevation to uh, comital rank, to earl's status. So famously, this is Castle Rising in Norfolk, uh, built by William de Albany, who not only marries Henry I's widow, Adelisa of Louvain, but is made uh, Earl of Arundel by King Stephen. Similarly, Essex, Aubrey de Vere, um, a man who uh, made good under Henry I, possibly begins the, uh, the keep at Headingham, uh, but his son, another Aubrey, uh, is made uh, Count of Guin in, uh, in Flanders, near Flanders, uh, by marriage, and then he's made Earl of Oxford by the Empress. So it may well be these towers are built as a statement of prestige. And the argument that these towers were not military, not even residential in some cases, has been put forward by Pamela Marshall. She argued that uh, Headingham, with this magnificent central arch and a balcony all the way around, you can go all the way around and keep at this level, uh, this great hall wasn't even residential, it has no um, domestic provision, that it was purely a hall of audience. So this is where the Earl would sit and welcome his tenants or his guests, sit in judgment perhaps on um, his honorial court. Um, that's perhaps a, a, an extreme example. Clearly, Richmond uh, has a number of different functions, but what is striking is that facing the town, are these three great windows. You can see how clearly they dominate the tower and they face into the town. So here's the first floor. The hall is above, we saw earlier. You have these three great windows and it's been suggested that this is where Earl um, Conan came to address his people or it was some form of lordly display. Not sure I'd like to do that on a winter's day in Yorkshire, but there you go. <laughs> Um, so, now, going back to Ludlow, if we remember, just bear in mind these three great windows, Derek Wren has suggested that at Ludlow, on the first floor above the gate, we have something similar. Now, the 15th century rebuilding has destroyed it, but if you imagine three of these windows in a row, and there is certainly evidence for another one, you can look and perhaps see if we can find it when we go on our tour, here's the one that we can see, but if you imagine three of those in a row, that lights the entrance lobby where there perhaps was a porter. You have some kind of grand um, show front, a parade front in Wren's words. So 
That leads us to the, uh, the final and last question, and I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that either. Uh, who does this? Who builds the keep up from the gatehouse? Well, um, it could be, if we were going on the earlier side, a man called Payne Fitzjohn, um, one of Henry I's new men, Curiales, who rises to power and wealth through uh, being sheriff of Hereford and Shropshire. So that would put it before 1137 when he's killed by the Welsh. Or it could be uh, this man, Jos de Dinon, a Breton, um, in the service uh, of the king, who is married to um, Sybil, the, the, the lacy heiress, who styles herself the Lady of Ludlow, um, and who is Castellan of Ludlow. Or third, if we're getting into the, uh, perhaps the 1140s, you know, 50s, 60s, Gilbert de Lacy, who after a long running battle with Jos de Dinon, finally comes to some kind of agreement, probably possibly brokered by Henry II, in which he regains much of the Ludlow inheritance. So possibly it's a celebration of his return to the family inheritance. So it would seem that one of these three men is the most likely, however, and it's a big however, um, in this period, during the, the so-called anarchy of Stephen's reign, Ludlow is a hotspot. It is being attacked all the time, um, and there was a war between Jos the Castellan, not only the Lacys, but also Hugh I of Mortimer. So it raises the question, how much building of that scale could you do in a time of military crisis? Maybe it sped the building for defensive purposes, um, but maybe it hindered it. And uh, again, there are no firm answers to this question. The archway, the new archway to the side of the Great Tower, being late uh, 12th century, suggests that it may have been the work of Walter de Lacy. The Lacy's are constantly in trouble with the king yeah, in, in, the, uh, in the late 12th century. But after um, many woes, de Lacy finds with the king to uh, get his inheritance returned to him um, in 1198. And again, that's a possible reason why he might mark that by blocking up the tower, turning that into a different kind of residential block uh, and having a new entrance. So I'm going to stop there. Um, as I say, more questions than answers, but that's what's so fascinating about Ludlow. Thank you very much for your patience. We've got time for a couple of quick questions. Obviously, there'll be further opportunities to ask questions to uh, Matt and to Malcolm and to John, our speaker this afternoon, uh, whilst we're going around uh, Ludlow Castle. Um, and also, this is the other comment I was going to make, is that I know that uh, there are a handful of Castle's experts in the audience, including a couple of colleagues from Cadu, uh, who might have some of the answers to, to your question on that. Uh, right, the lady at the back. Uh, Pamela Thompson, I'm very interested in the connection um, with the De Laces. Um, Ludlow is twinned with La Ferte Masse in Normandy, which is quite close to the beautiful medieval town of La Say. And I seem to recall from a long time ago that there's a, a substantial stone structure, which I remember like a keep on the hill at, at La Say. Uh, was that a castle? Did they have a castle there? Does anybody know more about that? that that's a great question. I can't answer that. I've not been to La Say, but uh, perhaps one of our, our expert witnesses can. I mean, again, it's one of the things that I would really like to know more about. What were the Norman seats of these men? As you say, I mean, it's at the Lacy. You would imagine at the caput of their original barony, they would want to build something high status and, and, and of stone. But as far as I'm aware, um, well, it's, put it this way, maybe it just shows we're very insular in our scholarship. It, it hasn't featured in any of the literature that, that I've looked at on, on the development of Ludlow. I'd like to um, just make a, a couple of points about the stonework in Ludlow Castle. Um, you've mentioned the difficulty in trying to unravel different periods of time. 
Um, but it might just be helpful when people go to realise that the red stone is much later than the grey stone. So even if you know nothing about geology, that might just help a little bit. I'd um, just like to make a little bit of a correction. The, 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 the original stone walls are not made of shale, it's calcareous siltstone. And that's the material that you see in the dry moats. Right. Um, shale would have disintegrated long ago. So um, it's a calcareous siltstone, it's the original grey stone. Um, there are two generations of the sandstone. Part of it is a greenish grey colour, um, and the other is a, a very distinctive red colour. The red coloured material, um, and to an extent the greenish grey, are not local. Um, the nearest source of the greenish grey material is Whitbatch, which is about um, two miles away to the northeast, and the nearest source of the red coloured stone is up at Holdgate, which is quite a way up Corkdale, about eight miles distant. And that, of course, raises the question of, of, of who paid for the, uh, the, the stonework and why they should have gone such a distance to get it. Thank you. Now, well, that's very important. And maybe you could point that out when we're, we're going around, key, key elements of that. Yes, it does. However, I mean, I would say that at least it's, you know, even though it's eight miles, that's pretty local. It's not like shipping calm, dressed ashlar <laughs> to build, um, you know, Norwich Castle or Norwich Cathedral, for example. So, um, yes, and I do wonder too whether the lack of ashlar, extensive quantities, speeds the building. So, with the kind of stone you were saying came, came from the, the ditch, is it actually easier to cut and build those fairly unsophisticated-looking walls? One would imagine it's, it's considerably quicker than something that's, you know, dressed ashlar with a filling. Um, but thank you, I, that, that's, that's important detail. Okay, thank, thanks very much, and thanks again to, to Max.